Okay, I would like to welcome you all. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you who are joining us from many different locations to what is the first memorial lecture dedicated to our beloved friend, comrade, teacher, mentor, and colleague, David Graeber. This is the first David Graeber memorial lecture and our first speaker is Dr. Alpa Shah. Before introducing Alpa, let me just say that this is a co-production, so to speak, convergence of efforts of several academic departments, all of them very dear to David, departments and universities that were close to David and to David's work. That is Anthropology and Social Change here at California Institute of Integral Studies. That is the Institute of Social Sciences and Humanities at BUAP, Puebla, Mexico. The Elizabeth Breer School of Social Innovation located at St. Paul University in Ottawa, Canada. And the university that David cared about a lot, and that is Rojava University located in Syria. David visited most of these places, if not all, several times. And it is very emotional. And this is in many ways speaking as a host or one of the hosts, the most difficult lecture that I ever had to introduce. So this is a moment when we celebrate David and we have decided to celebrate David in company of one of his closest colleagues and closest friends, and that is Alpa Shah. So I'm just briefly going to introduce Alpa, who is a friend and a comrade, and somebody from whom I learned a lot, especially from his first book, which is called In the Shadows of the State, published in 2010 a book that was dedicated about indigenous politics to indigenous politics, environmentalism, migration, development, based on long-term participant observation amongst indigenous people in India. And Alpa's second book that came out in, I believe it was 2018, was ground down by growth, tribe, caste, class, and inequality in 21st century India which became the book of the year for the Hindu. She has also co-curated a photo exhibition behind the Indian boom based on this research. However, the book that Alpa is probably best known for is called Night March. And the full title is Night March Among India's Revolutionary Guerrillas. And this book has become something of uh, a must read among different departments of anthropology, and I would add political science, sociology across the world. It was a winner of 2020 Association of Political and Legal Anthropology Book Prize. It was shortlisted for 2019 All World Prize for Political Writing and the New India Foundation Book Prize. It was also a 2018 Book of the Year for the New Statesman, History Workshop, So India, Hindu Year in Review book, a Hong Kong Free Press Best Human Rights book, and a public anthropologist must read. It is a remarkable book. And the book itself was based on years of Alpa living as an anthropologist with indigenous communities, trying to understand the question that is all too clear to understand for people who had spent time in India, which is why are they taking up arms to fight for a more just society. And what does that actually mean? When you undertake a seven night track, and this is what Night March refers to, when Alpa found herself dressed as an exolite guerrilla in an exolite guerrilla platoon, walking what I believe was 250 kilometers across a very dense forest in Eastern India, at the peak of counterinsurgency operations in 2010. Now, the Nexalites, and we are going to hear a lot about the way the Nexalites behave politically, are portrayed as uh, portrayed by the media in India 
by the government in India as a deadly terrorist group. They're inspired by Marx, they're inspired by Lenin, and they're of course inspired by Mao. And they're trying to overthrow a system that has abused them for decades in what I believe it is today the world's lo longest running armed insurgency. The book is remarkable and it is not the three books that I just mentioned are not the only ones that Alpa authored or co-authored, but I'm going to stop myself here and just repeat once again that Alpa is at the moment associate professor or reader in anthropology at London School of Economics, where she also leads a research team at the LSE International and Equalities Institute on Global Economies of Care. Again, welcome to the first David Graeber Memorial Lecture 2021. Uh, our speaker is Al Pasha, and this event has been organized by several universities across the world who came together to celebrate our friend David Graeber. Thank you and welcome, Alpa. Thank you, Andre. I'd like to begin by thanking you and all the colleagues in California, in Mexico, in Ottawa, in Rojava, for initiating this David Graeber Memorial Lecture Series. I'm sure that David is smiling with glee because of this collaborative effort because comrades across the world and in both Rojava and Mexico, so dear to his heart are coming together to champion these annual lectures. So it's a deep honor to stand in solidarity with you today to inaugurate the series. It is of course a very painful task, but we must pay tribute to our dear friend, collaborator and comrade who inspired readers across the world who used his anthropology and his privileges and his powers to tirelessly open up the human imagination, question the inequalities that dominate us and show us that another world is indeed possible. What was so wonderful about David was not just that he was one of the greatest minds one could ever meet, but that he was so generous in his thinking, his writing and acting. And he gave us all so much hope, hope to change the world, make it a better place. And he showed us that despite all the misery, all the drudgery and oppression, we couldn't be drowned by it. We had to fight, we had to fight with passion, we had to fight with laughter. And we had to discover all the hidden beauty around us and give it space to grow. When I was sinking in a sea of darkness after a year and a half in the forests of Eastern India, where a brutal counterinsurgency was being waged against Marx, Lenin and Mao inspired Naxlite guerrillas, it was David who gently slowly but persistently gave me hope to live and act in the world again. For more than 10 years, David and I were not only colleagues, but the deepest of friends, talking daily for years, knowing the other one was there. It's hard for all of us who are close to him, personally or through his writings, to come to terms with his loss. David was fun, he was kind, he was caring, he was generous. All of these qualities are reflected in his writings. When I met David, he had just published two remarkable, remarkable books. There's The Lost People, his ethnography of Madagascar and Towards an Anthropological Theory of Value. And apart from a range of journal articles, there was also fragments of an anarchist anthropology which is a kind of manifesto for what was to follow. And he was working on Debt, the book that the world beyond was waiting to read, published just after the 2008 financial crisis. In the years since, I watched from close quarters the excitement of discovery and mischief, the plotting and the curation, the sleepless nights and the pain with which he grew his extraordinary gifts of writing. 
he cultivated them beyond the ivory towers of the university and into the streets with boundless energy. David brought anthropology to the world and at the same time, he fundamentally transformed anthropology. David wrote furiously as though there were no tomorrow. He communicated as widely as he could ideas that could, that could be used to shape a more emancipated world. Well, David, you have succeeded in becoming immortal. And this lecture series is one testament to that. I have to admit that when the invitation to inaugurate the series came, I wanted to decline, postpone, Andre will recall. They say that time will heal, that in time we develop new relationships with those who leave us. But to write a lecture for you now, David, would have been to stare endlessly at a blank screen, tears welling up. But then I recalled that I had already a meditation that was tributed to you. So David, I share it with you amidst our friends and comrades. You may be surprised. For living with the tragedy of revolutionary utopianists in the jungles of India, I always reminded you of the dystopia that is embedded in utopia and why we can't just offer other possibilities. Why we need to merge the ideationalist with the materialist, reinsert the political and economic forces of history into our ideologies of social change. In fact, I increasingly came to understand what I was doing as some sort of marriage between your anarchist inspiration and the Marxist inspiration of my jungle friends in India. But David, in this lecture, I'm putting aside the materialist in me. I'm indulging fully in your spirit and I'm immersing myself in you and the sheer power of imagination as you saw yourself doing, I present an anthropological gift, an offering for other possibilities for how we could continue to rethink democracy and leadership. So let me begin. Liberal democracy as a means of collective self-rule and the values it has promoted has revealed itself to be hollow. Democratically elected leaders routinely deprive people of basic rights, serve their own interests, that of corporate power, generating vast inequalities. In the nations which considered themselves as global custodians of democracy, fighting war on terror to defend democracy from its foreign enemies, Seasoned bullies have ruled. I, uh, I don't want to name any names, but let me, if I can, I will show you a picture. <laughs> um, oof, I can't figure out how to share, share slides here. Hang on a second. Oh, well, perhaps you don't need them. You don't need to imagine the seasoned bullies that rule our world. And you don't need a picture to see them in your minds. In the Democracy Project, David um, highlighted that the thing that we call democracy, with its professional politicians, its political parties, and its preoccupation with money, has been entirely co-opted by financial capitalism. This is no accident. It's not that democracy has failed, but that what most people call democracy is in fact the opposite of the real thing. It protects the interests of the few at the expense of the many. In India, the country where I have done most of my field research, Hindu supremacism has taken hold with Narendra Modi at the helm, a man whose chest size is more disgust in public fora than the thousands of Muslims murdered under his watch. With the country celebrated as the world's largest democracy, it is procedural democracy that is fetishized, right? The way that rulers are elected, that there is a routine process of casting a vote, 
not the kinds of powers they hold, the way it is exercised or the values they promote. Elections have come to stand for some kind of gold standard of what democracy ought to be. Today, under such electoral democracy, the constitutional promises of equality and dignity are very far-fetched. Many people are disappeared, thrown into detention camps, have their land snatched from under their feet, the last vestiges of basic labor rights undermined. In the last weeks, we have seen hundreds of thousands being killed because of the crimes of negligence of humanity that are being laid bare by the COVID-19 pandemic. In India, anyone speaking out against these injustices is likely to be harassed by the police, have cases filed against them and face imprisonment. Intellectuals, lawyers, democratic rights activists have been targeted many of my colleagues and friends are now in prison. Under democracy has flourished a form of capitalism that has exacerbated stark socioeconomic inequalities backed by extreme violence, both concealed and open. It's clear that we need a radical rethinking of the values of leadership that underpin liberal electoral democracies. In the spirit of our comrades in Mexico and Rojava, who have for decades been experimenting with democracy, we need, we need new models of how to imagine and practice its core values. What kind of leaders would be required if leaders at all? We need a revolution in how we think about leadership and democracy. So drawing on my long-term research, living as an anthropologist amongst uh, India's indigenous people who are, who are popularly called Adivasis, what I'm going to do is compare three different models of leadership and democracy with the intention of drawing attention to one that is hidden even within India. So the first is that promoted in liberal electoral politics. The second is leadership amongst revolutionary Marx, Lenin, Mao inspired insurgents. And the final one on which I will dwell the most is sortition. So this is the drawing of lots, a lottery, or the random selection of rotating leaders. From the remote jungle margins of India, I'm gonna present models and analysis, which I think are of pressing global relevance. Marshall Salins, David's teacher who passed away last month, is an inspiration for the method of uncontrolled comparison that I draw on. He developed it in his famous comparative piece on the Melanes Melanesian big man versus the Polynesian chief. Now these models are abstract sociological types of which there will be important variants and exceptions not treated in any depth. As Salin said, considerations of the variants and ex exceptions is necessary and desirable Yet there is pleasure too, and some intellectual reward, he said, in discovering broad patterns. To this intellectual pleasure, in David's spirit, I would add that there is a political necessity in discovering other ways of living in the world, highlighting other perspectives as a critique of our own reality and for envisioning other possibilities. As such, my lecture today is unashamedly utopian. For as I will show, the model of democracy and leadership that I want to highlight is disappearing even amongst the indigenous people I lived with. Yet, I believe it is important to draw attention to, to for it may help us rethink the premises of our own practices of democracy. As David suggested, Social theory should refashion itself in the manner of a direct democratic process, in the sense that one obvious role for a radical intellectual is to look at those who are creating viable alternatives, try to figure out what might be the larger implications of what they're already doing, and then offer those ideas back, not as prescriptions, but as contributions, as possibilities, as gifts. So I'm gonna proceed by discussing three different models of democracy as they impact on one community, 
the indigenous people I lived with in India. Starting with democracy by sortition, turning to the rise of liberal democracy, and finally, the spread of Marxist-Leninist, Maoist, revolutionary democracy. I'm going to suggest that if the insurgents prioritize economic inequality in their analysis for revolutionary transformation, their struggle takes place through a party which is organized by extreme political hierarchy that suppresses individuality. In contrast, liberal demo democracy promotes political equality based on individual rights, but does not challenge economic inequality. I will show that the Adivasi leaders who are rising in both these systems, that's liberal electoral democracy or Marxist-Leninist Maoist revolutionary democracy, have brought new economic inequalities into their communities. And with that also new political hierarchies of the values of caste. It is in democracy by sortition, the random selection of rotating leaders that we have a system in which everyone is equally a potential leader where the values of egalitarianism prevail both politically and economically alongside a flourishing of individual autonomy. With this comparison, I will chart some of my wider aims. The first is to highlight the existence of practices of democracy by sortition, which has received almost no scholarly or political attention globally. In South Asia, I will suggest this failure is a, re is a result of the overwhelming dominance of scholarship on hierarchy, which has neglected the study of more egalitarian values that lie in its jungle margins. We need not only to introduce new radical traditions of democracy, but also to make scholarship more democratic. I will also suggest that democracy by sortition is diffusely connected beyond India to practices of sortition in Nepal, in China, and perhaps beyond. My second aim is to call for a re-reading of leadership amongst indigenous populations. I'm gonna show that we need for that I'm going to show the need for a vision of societies in which everyone may be a leader. In our in India, I argue that this directs us to actually push back against the critique of indigenous people for failing to produce leaders. It's a common critique made of indigenous people, and signals a very profound rereading of the history of indigenous anti-colonial rebellions. My final aim is to highlight the virtues of sortition in creating democratic society globally. Let us remember that in ancient Athens and medieval Florence, voting in leaders in elections was thought to be aristoc aristocratic and it was, uh, and it was sortition um, that was at the heart of democracy. Let us celebrate how this idea is being revived, whether it is through the remaking of the Irish constitution or the extinction rebels and climate assemblies. And rather than cast them off as savage, bar barbaric or absurd, let us learn from the possibilities offered by indigenous people for rethinking contemporary democracy globally. Let's democratize democracy. Okay, so um, I'd like to um, take you the jungles of Eastern India. And I'll see if I can get some uh, slides going, hang on. Um. Oh, here we go. Yeah, yeah, let's let, let me take you into the jungles of Eastern India. I think I can share my screen here. There we go. Can you see it? Yeah, great. Thanks, Andre. So this is the state of Jharkhand, the, 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 the bit that's yellow in, in, in the diagram, there it is. 
um, in the, uh, it's dominated, um, these jungles are dominated, where I lived were dominated by the Munda and the Arau people. These are people who form part of wider groups which are generally referred to as Adivasi. This is a popular term uh, for those considered tribal or autochthonous to India, it's indigenous people who've historically lived in its forested and hilly frontiers. Classified by the Indian government as its scheduled tribes, um, that's STs for short, they're just, uh, they're at about just over 100 million. They account for about 8.8% of the country's population. Adivasis uh, are labeled some of the poorest people in the world, but I think that they may be some of the richest. That is once we learn to look beyond the quantification of wealth in terms of GDP income or assets and start thinking about values such as humanity, solidarity, the good life, or indeed democracy. Those who have lived for several years amongst these forest dwellers as one of them have remarked that many of their communities are quite at odds uh, with the values of hierarchy that have dominated the analysis of India. Adivasi groups are noted for their relatively egalitarian or anti-authoritarian values and the dignity and pride with which they hold these values when compared to the caste divided hierarchical communities of the plains of India. This is not to say that there is no hierarchy amongst Adivasis, nor that all groups are equally egalitarian. And of course, egalitarianism by no means equates to equivalence that everyone is the same or even aspires to be the same. By egalitarian values, I mean that people see each other as equals, equal to themselves, and thus value each other equally as human beings, including their individual autonomy, respecting similarities and differences. Such values generate a fundamental respect for others, not because of some qualities they happen to have, for instance, talent or merit, wealth or status, nor because they conform to some kind of straitjacket of an ideal person, but for whoever they are. Egalitarian values appear in many aspects of Adivasi life. They appear in the relative absence of the show of wealth or the idea of saving or accumulating, the significance given to sharing, mutual aid and labor exchange, the relative gender equality. And what I focus on today is the egalitarian spirit through which communities are led. Scholars have noted that India's forest dwellers do not have forms of rule that rep represent enduring structures of domination and exploitation, that they are societies largely detached from politics as leadership and control. A quintessential example of these anti-hierarchical, anti-authoritarian values appears in the idea of democracy by sortition as I witnessed it in the selection of vill village leaders where I lived. So among the Mundas and the Oraos, the most important position of responsibility in the village are those held by the Pahan, what's called the Pahan and his helper, the Pahanbara. These indigenous authorities are, facilitate all the kind of conflicts that arise amongst the Adivasis, whether it's a marriage dispute or it's a land claim or an accusation of theft or witchcraft. They feed the whole village three times a year during important agricultural festivals. They look after families who are falling upon times of need in a kind of provision of the welfare state. They propitiate the village spirits with blood sacrifices to pr protect the community from drought, fire and disease. And for all of these purposes, special lands are put aside for them and they have seven helpers who also have allocated lands. I'm going to return to these responsibilities, but what I want to begin with is how the Pahan and Painbara are chosen, which is a remarkable process which takes place every three years and which I first happened to witness in November 2000. So um, here we go. Let me show you a picture. Um, it was the morning after a festival called the Kalyani festival, which initiates the first uh, kind of rice harvest. 
many Mundas had gathered in the agricultural fields. There was lots and lots of rice beer because the spirits need drink, so do the ancestors. Everyone was happily mer merry. A man with a light, light shadow was blindfolded, as you can see here in this picture, uh, in this painting rather. Uh, and he was given a wooden pole at the end of which was a winnowing basket. The outgoing Pahan uh, threw a few rice grains. He called in the village spirit Saranamai to possess and, di and direct this blindfolded man. And soon this winnowing basket started shaking and the man walked off as if he was led by the spirit. He wandered from field to hamlet. He moved from house to house. Villagers gathered behind him. And at the, at the, at, at, at the first house he entered, you see him entering this house um, here, uh, he, um, uh, uh, he stopped shaking, which meant that the spirit had left him um, and uh, chosen this house to settle in to provide the next Pahan for the next three years. Then this man was blindfolded again, he was possessed again, he once more wandered from house to house till the spirit eventually left him again to settle at another house. There a man who was um, dressed in his loincloth was quietly eating his lunch uh, while uh, the spirit declared his household uh, and, and therefore him the new, new pine borough for the next three years. And he kind of unceremoniously continued to finish eating his lunch. Now, a few years later, I stumbled upon this selection process in the village immediately neighboring the one where I lived. It was taking place with a slightly different twist, but with exactly the same principles. So there, you know, there were these like rocks, which all represented different households, a circle of rocks, and the guy kind of basically stumbled around blindfolded and whichever rock he ended up at became the new, new Pahan uh, for the next, uh, next three years. Um, I then realized that this kind of method of random selecting of rotating leaders is, was actually common in about a hundred of the neighboring villages and was recognized way back in 1932 in the colonial land settlement reports, which demarcated land for these roles. Years later, I realized that um, this method of selecting uh, leaders represent what others describe as democracy by sortition. Now there's a number of important um, things to note about this process. The first is that these practices of choosing a leader are so democratic that it is a lottery as to who is selected. And of course, you know, I was kind of skeptical of the whole thing. So I traced the history of the Pahan and Pineborough selection to the last, to the previous 15 years, and I found no pattern. Secondly, implied in democracy by sortition is that not only can any household be chosen, but every single household has the qualities of leading. Indeed, it, it shouldn't really matter who leads because everyone can potentially do, do so. Third, um, leadership requires no special qualities that sets one above the rest. And this is in stark contrast to the dominant models in the contemporary world whereby leadership is encouraged through meritocracy, individualized and personalized attributes of courage, vision, direction, clarity, passion, talent, you know, charisma, wealth, rank or status. In fact, uh, and fourth, often people don't really actually care to be leaders at all. They don't groom, they don't accumulate or petition for leadership. Rather, it's a duty or a responsibility, sometimes even a burden to serve the village. Fifth, this form of democracy ensures the impermanence of power. So the responsibility to lead rotates every three years. So power doesn't actually concentrate in any one individual or family. Sixth, real power lies in the collective of the community itself. Any important decisions involve the whole community in a process of open deliberation to reach consensus, often taking several hours and sometimes several days. So I never heard of, the, of, of a Pahan or a Pahanbara imposing their will, taking collective decisions on their own. 
Seventh, um, lastly, it would be easy to characterize this as a kind of leaderless or acephalous system, but this would be to miss the point that actually anyone can lead and leadership therefore rests in everyone. Now, there are several caveats to note that I don't have time to go into uh, at any length, but I'm going to mention very briefly. First, these systems are meaningful only to some of the Adivasis, not those who had Christianized, not those who had Hinduized. Uh, second, corruption of the system can happen if rotation uh, ceases. Third, the spirits select households, but in fact, it is uh, you know, men, not women, who carry out the leadership responsibilities. Fourth, um, I found evidence of such practices only at the village level, not, the, not beyond. Lastly, it could be argued that the ultimate selection of these indigenous leaders is down to the spirits, not at all random. But despite all of these ifs and buts, well, all of which would need to be thought through, what I seek to propose here is that at the core of leadership by sortition are ideals of democracy that counter the entrenchment of hierarchy, power, status, and inequality. And this is in stark contrast to the hierarchical ideology of India's caste system, where only the selected few have the right to rule. It's not represented in the classic debates of Indian society at all, for underwriting leadership by sortition is the fact that politics, economics, or religion are inseparable. Significantly, political power is not a means to economically rise above others, in fact, leaders are bearers of a community-based ba community egalitarian values in which significant economic stratification between Adivasis is discouraged. So uh, democracy by sortition then uh, represents a system in which political and economic equality go hand in hand. As such, it's at odds with the two other models of democracy revolutionary democratic centralism and electoral voting to which I now turn. So with Indian independence came liberal electoral democracy. Today, India, as you know, is often celebrated as the world's largest democracy, home to one quarter of the world's voters. And the modern democratic state with its constitution and its ballot box is credited with spreading the ideals of equality based on individual rights to replace the hierarchical values of caste in India. But through the lens of indigenous communities, liberal norms of democracy are in fact replacing egalitarian values with the ideas of equal rights as property to create both new hierarchical values and new socioeconomic inequalities. Nowhere is this more evident than in the rise of the leader elected through the ballot box, the member of legislative assembly, the MLA. With the modern state came the granting of equal opportunity for all uh, on the basis of citizenship, but also special opportunities for some on the basis of community because of the historic injustices they suffered which need rectification. So India actually put in place um, a very extensive um, policies of affirmative action for its Adivasis, uh, its STs and its Dalits, scheduled caste, so schedule, um, um, sched um, scheduled caste populations. These include reservations for uh, scheduled castes and scheduled tribes as MLAs or mem MPs, members of parliament in areas where they are numerically dominant as well as reserved places in higher education in government institutions uh, in proportion to their representation in the total population. Now, I don't have time to explore the nuances of the transformation in Adivasi relations with the state that followed, but what I share now is that where I lived, the first Adivasi MLAs tried to win over the indigenous vote, the Adivasi vote, and to get people to vote in the first place by protecting indigenous systems from the reach of the state. So democracy as an ideal was actually separated from the modern state. Over time though, the MLA's own participation in the electoral process undermined Adivasi egalitarian values. 
This is because as an MLA, it's necessary to operate in the wider electoral system governed by the higher castes and classes, negotiate one's position at the regional and national level in party and state structures, compete in terms which are set by a very different set of values of cultivating individual power, accumulating wealth, charisma and status. The result is that leaders end up differentiating themselves from their communities. They build themselves, you know, brick mansions in place of mud huts. They wear, you know, the kurta pajama, the white pants and, and trousers or pants and shirts instead of uh, the kind of lungi or wraparound. They cultivate an image of their anytime access to muscle power against those in their way. And they increasingly treat women as their property. At the heart of this transformation, I believe, is that uh, electoral democracy in India brings very different values of leadership to the indigenous model I described earlier, one which involves the intertwining of crime, business and politics in a kind of mafia rule or Raj that some have said has now become indigenous to South Asia. Marxist critiques of procedural electoral dem democracy have long argued it's simply the tool of a tiny majority class to rule and that democracy under capitalism formally separates politics from economics. On the one hand, you have procedural democracy promising political equality. Everyone can equally vote in, in, um, uh, in a representative government. But on the other hand, the structures and processes that per perpetuate economic inequality um, uh, are, are kind of left, uh, are, are, are left intact. Um, <laughs> recent changes in, in, in the Indian law have actually laid bare the, the ways in which the capitalist classes are completely um, uh, um, intertwined with, 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 um, with political power um, uh, because there's increased spending, corporate spending on elections is allowed, corporate power can unashamedly now control uh, the state, just like in the US. My wider point is that looking bottom up from the experience of indigenous communities, while procedural electoral democracy may allow um, uh, indigenous people to, uh, to enter mainstream politics, it also brings in a new form of leadership which goes together with the cultivation of new inequalities and hierarchies. So where I live, the first three Adivasi MLAs who dominated electoral politics from the 1960s came to be seen as immoral, spoiled men echoing the old adage that you know power corrupts however as a younger generation of adivasi youth arise who can also access state sector jobs and move beyond the worlds of their parents the new values which are being cultivated by these mlas represent a much wider transformation of adivasi norms let me um, summarize some of that here through this uh, slide I can share it, let's see. Um, there we go. Yeah. So yeah, these are the these are the last chief ministers of Jharkhand. Um there we go. So yeah, we have you know new degrees of accumulating uh, and saving money, new kinds of patterns of consumption, seeking to present an individual above the rest. All changes bringing in a kind of new economic differentiation amongst the Adivasis. At the same time, um, low caste upward mobility comes with them reproducing many higher caste values. The most striking example is a more patriarchal machismo amongst men at the heart of, of which is the control of women's sexuality. But perhaps the greatest uh, tragedy um, of the hierarchical values enhanced by the spread of the liberal democratic state amongst Adivasis is actually the feeling of one's infer inferiority vis-a-vis -vis others uh, in the social, above, above you in the social hierarchy. So if Adivasis once roamed the forests and fields with the confidence, autonomy, autonomy and dignity in themselves, their increased participation in the liberal processes in the liberal democratic state and the mod in, actually interiorizes the inferiority that others have ascribed to them. 
This is a psychological trauma that Varia Elwin so astutely described as a kind of loss of nerve. The political response uh, from Adivasi, polit Adivasi political leaders to this loss of nerve is a development of, of a kind of identity politics, of an Adivasi identity politics. Indeed, the introduction of the very term Adivasi is itself a part of this, demanding equal recognition, recognition on the basis of identity, which is now seen as a kind of property, but it's actually got little to do with the indigenous values represented in leadership by sortition. So, my basic proposition then is that democratically elected leaders are bearers of a system of political equality based on individual or group rights, which in fact exacerbates economic inequalities as some individuals seek to rise above the rest. And that amongst the Adivasis actually brings new hierarchical values combined with a rising inferiority complex. So altogether, these changes undermine the egalitarian values that democratic leadership through sortition represents. Now, um, let me turn to my final uh, model um, of democracy. Spreading amongst the Adivasis were those who saw electoral democracy as a sham, who considered economic inequality as a source of all oppression, and who for the last 50 years had been fighting for an equal society for everyone, a true democracy, a communist one. These were Marx, Lenin and Mao inspired insurgents, underground armed revolutionaries, popularly called the Naxalites after the Himalayan village of Naxalbari where they raised their first rebellion in 1967. Three decades later, they began creating um, their guerrilla strongholds in the forests and hills of central and eastern India, where the Adivasis lived. Although many outsiders before them had actually failed to infiltrate these forests, the Adivasis became the main support base of the Naxlites, and it's here in the heart of the country that the guerrillas grew in strength. In 2004, various Naxalite groups united to form the Communist Party of India, Maoist, to strengthen their armed fight to take over the Indian state. Soon these Maoists, as they became called, were labeled India's greatest internal security threat by the then prime minister and new rounds of counterinsurgency operations to wipe them out were begun and are ongoing. I happen to live uh, in an Orao dominated village in a guerrilla stronghold of the Maoists between 2008 and 2010 at the peak of counterinsurgency operations and explored not only the wider changes amongst the Adivasi caused by the, caused by the guerrilla movement, but also life in the guerrilla armies. As per Marxist Leninist theory, for these Indian Maoists, liberal electoral democracy, allegedly devoted to public interest, put in place leaders who served their own private purpose of hunting for higher positions, making a career. They followed Lenin, who said that democracy is the best political shell for capitalism and the real essence of bourgeois parliamentarianism, you know, that's the language they use, was to decide once every few years which members of the ruling class is to repress and crush the people through parliament. So to celebrate democracy because people cast a vote at the polling booth completely ignores the wider power relations at stake in the electoral process, which exploit and oppress them daily. For them, liberal democracy is an instrument of class oppression designed to reproduce a system of economic exploitation. A revolution is essential to bring about true democracy, a real participatory democracy as enshrined in communism. Of course, what this true democracy would look like, no one spelled out, though there is endless debate about how to get there. The Indian Naxalites following Lenin and Mao organized themselves as a vanguard party in a protracted people's war to move from the countryside to the city, Maoist fashion. So their presence in the Adivasi villages brought in very different values of leadership and democracy to those at the center of sortition or the liberal representative democratic model. In March, the military structure governed by Leninist democratic centralism. In theory, all committees were democratically elected with space to criticize, debate, resolve differences. 
but a disciplined hierarchy prevailed with the individual subordinate to the party, the minority subordinate to the majority, the lo lower level subordinate to the higher levels, and of course the entire party subordinate to the central committee at the top. Mao's theory of the mass line summarized by the phase from the masses to the masses introduced a strategy for the working classes to contribute bottom up to the political direction of the party, but leadership was overwhelmingly top down. Unlike liberal democracy, leadership was not based on status nor on wealth or charisma, but above all on the commitment to the revolutionary cause. The subordination of any form of self-interest to that of the party, the willingness to start sacrifice everything, including one's own life, uh, to the cause. So in theory, anyone could get up the party hierarchy as long as they showed commitment um, to the theory and practice. This commitment involved fighting not only for a new world economic order to bring about equality for everyone, um, but also the creation of a new communal subjectivity in the present, transforming yourself, right? For communism wasn't just the dream of a distant future, it had to be fought for in the process of the revolution itself, in the remaking of people, in social relations anew, in a kind of prefigurative politics of the struggle. So leadership was exemplary of a non-egotistic, classless, casteless subject was supposed to be. A new name was given to the new recruits, not just for security reasons, but to get rid of all the baggage of the past. Party members were supposed to get rid of all their casteist practices, give up all forms of private property, refrain from any kind of worldly pleasures and the consumption of luxuries, and any deviance re risk being seen as kind of egotistic and individuals pursuit of self end, selfish ends uh, and private interests. There were Maoist practices of criticism and self-criticism and rectification, which were crucial for individual reform. With this making of revolutionary subjectivity also came the repression of individualism and creativity to which I will, I will come back. Um, my book, Night March explores the many facets of the contradictions of the making of this revolutionary subjectivity through which the Maoists undermine their own aims. But the issue I want to focus on here is the contradictions arising out of the social gulf which emerged between the leadership and the Adivasi uh, rank and file. So since leadership is dependent on commitment, which can only be shown over time, leaders are actually a small clique of middle class, upper caste men politi politicized together as students in the, six, six in, in, in the cities in the 1980s and 90s. If these leaders broke with their pasts for a higher cause to go underground, in contrast, the indigenous youth moved in and out of the guerrilla armies as though they were going to live with an uncle or an aunt. They joined more for, more for reasons of personal autonomy, a fight with a parent, a sibling, a love affair, to see a different world, rather than the lofty goals of the transformation of the world or even the local order. Very few actually stayed within the party going a little way up the party hierarchies. That the Adivasis felt so comfortable to move in, in and out of the guerrilla armies was a tribute to the success of these leaders uh, in treating them as equal human beings. Because in fact, all other outsiders had cast them off as savage, as wild, as barbaric. Uh, and in fact, I show that rather than reasons of coercion, greed, or grievance commonly thought to be behind the spread of such insur insurgencies, this emotional intimacy which was developed between the guerrillas and the Adivasis allowed you know, the movement to spread. But uh, as these Maoists uh, were so subservient to a party stuck structure that was dedicated to a specific program of transformation, a stages program of transformation, transformation, uh, which was hierarchically imposed, uh, as the ego had to be arrested, as individuality had to be submerged, as human imaginations had to be stifled. Ultimately, what happened was a common leftist upper caste imagination of Adivasi life prevails amongst the leadership. And this is that the Adivasis are above all economically exploited, their women sexually oppressed, including by their own men, their societies, vestiges of a past that has to be eradicated. 
So they completely disregarded the economic and political um, values that already existed amongst the Adivasis, uh, for they had kind of doomed them to the dustbin of history. The science of their revolution became like a kind of religious dogma, which might have enabled a small number of them to stay together, but which disabled them from taking full account of what existed around them, undermining their own reach. Their Maoist economic analysis of semi-feudalism prevented them from seeing how capitalism was spreading in the Adivasi areas, including through their own actions. And the tragedy is that this leads to their own role in diminishing Adivasi egalitarian values. So these Maoists are nurturing a slow social and economic transformation, slow economic and political transformation amongst the Adivasis, though it's not one that they planned or recognized. It comes from the fact that they insert themselves into the same capitalist extortion rackets around state development schemes, big business main, that mainstream politicians like MLAs are a part of and through which illicit money is gained. So like others who rise in the party hierarchies, for the few Adivasis who ended staying up within the party, who are tasked with collecting funds, it's always very tempting to pocket away some uh, for, from the party needs into your own pockets, you know, raise your own mud hut into a multi-story brick buildings, acquire your own, you know, four-wheel drive, Bolero, your, your kind of Land Rover, send your children to private school. A new generation of Adivasi mini entrepreneurs was nurtured, Frankenstein's monsters, I call them, in Night March, seeking to line their own personal pockets in a similar fashion to the MLAs rising above the, the rest of the communities, creating economic stratification amongst the Adivasis. So um, what you have then is a similar process being reproduced through, uh, through the Adivasi MLAs in, in, uh, by, the, by the Naxalites themselves. So the upshot is that these revolutionary leaders are fighting for economic equality. They're doing so through a deeply hierarchical political structure that accelerates the rise of e economic inequalities amongst the Adivasis, bringing new hierarchical values of caste into their communities. And this is, the irony is that this is despite them trying to decast and declass themselves. So they're mimicking the very structures of inequality they seek to crush. They seek to crush the greatest tragedy is the undermining of the political and economic world that is far more egalitarian than the one that they are creating amongst indigenous populations. I'll just show you a few kind of thoughts before I end with like my conclusion. Um, here we go. Oh yeah. Oh, I forgot to show you this. Yeah, this is the kind of Naxlite uh, armies um, where I where I worked and lived. Uh, it's my book. Um, yeah, these are the Basis. All right, here we go. So some kind of concluding thoughts. Um, let me summarize the three different models of democracy and leadership that I have explored. To start with the last first, democracy and leadership as exhibited by the Marx, Lenin and Mao inspired revolutionaries, the Naxlites. Here we have those aiming to create a more equal democratic world. They're prioritizing challenging economic inequality in the analysis for transformation, but their struggle takes place through a party which is organized by extreme political hierarchy, which is suppressing individuality. They take root amongst the Adivasis because of their egalitarian values. However, their economic determinism and program of stages transformation leads them to ignore the forms of social economic equality which already exist amongst the Adivasis. Result is that the Adivasis influenced by these revolutionaries brought new economic inequalities into their communities. In India, this has gone hand in hand with emulating the lifestyles of higher castes bringing in new political hierarchies in Adivasi communities through the increased penetration of the values of caste. In the second model, we have the spread of liberal electoral democracy in which leaders are bearers of a system of political equality based on individual rights, but which doesn't challenge economic inequality. Adivasi leaders rising in this system have brought new economic inequalities into their communities and with that, as with the Naxalites, also new political hierarchies of caste into their communities. In the first model, 
where democracy place takes place through sortition, the random selection of rotating leaders, we have a system in which everyone is equally a potential leader, where the values of egalitarianism prevail, both politically and economically, alongside a flourishing of individual autonomy. So in thinking comparatively about these three cases, my wider aims have been um, threefold. First, uh, I have tried to, I have been, I have been trying to, I've been seeking to highlight, perhaps for the first time, the existence of indigenous traditions of democracy by sortition in India, and to suggest that this may have a wider presence not yet recognized. Indeed, since working on this lecture, I began finding remarkable buried cases of random selection of rotating leaders in the work of eth ethnographers of the Tibetan Himal Himalayas, both in Ladakhi, India and in Nepal, rarely recognized even in the small subfield of political anthropology of South Asia, despite the brilliance of their revelations. I'm thinking of people like Fernanda Piri, Charles Rambles here. I also found such cases stretching into China what my revelation suggests is that scholars have overlooked egalitarian values and indigenous democratic traditions beyond the modern state and its elections. No doubt this is the case in most parts of the world. As David Graeber and David Wengrove noted, any attempt to suggest Europeans learned anything at all of moral or social value from native people, they're talking about democracy, is met with mild derision and accusations of indulging in the noble savage tropes, right? Or occasionally almost hysterically condemned, you know? Uh, in South Asia, part of the failure to take seriously these traditions may be also explained by the overwhelming dominance of scholarship on hierarchy in India, the focus on empires and the state, the major contributors of the dumont holcart debates held positions of power in Indian sociology across continents and across disciplines, anthropology, sociology, political science, Indology, history. Such was their sheer weight and force, their scholarly clout, that for se several decades, those who tried to draw attention to the comparatively more egalitarian variants were likely to have been reproached as romantics as worst, no doubt what I will be accused of today, or proponents of Gandhian village republics as best and cast off to the margins of the institutions of scholarly production, sidelined or simply ignored. Thus, so highlighting these practices of democracy as sortition in India is important not only as an, as an offering towards experiments of democracy, but also as an offering to make scholarship on South Asia more democratic. Moreover, we need to think beyond the nationalist boundaries uh, you know, of, our, of our scholarship, right? And unearth the wider subterranean practices of democratic sortition that may have existed transnationally well beyond our current borders. On this, I think we need much more scholarship from anthropologists working with political scientists, historians, and of course, archeologists. But what I wish to suggest here is that these relatively egalitarian societies of the Southeast Asian um, massif called Zomia, which tried to stay away from state control, um, may have extended beyond the regions which were identified by James Scott and Willem van Schendel right into the heart of India in the Adivasi belts in the forests and hills of the center and the east. And what my lecture might be excavating is that these Zomia societies might have included democratic sortition practices that stretch from India into current day Nepal and Southwest China and have since been erased in almost all but a few exceptional places like where by chance I lived among the Adivasis. Second, um, I'm calling for a rereading of, of leadership amongst indigenous populations in India. I'm showing that we need a theoretical and practical vision that argues not for societies without leaders, but in which everyone may be a leader. Democrat, demo, democracy by sortition is underpinned by ideals of leadership and values of egalitarianism amongst Adivasis that are far removed from the common trope of the homo hierarchicus of South Asia, values that have more in common with the ideals of egalitarianism and leadership that anthropologists have unveiled of small scale societies dispersed through Southeast Asia in Amazonia or among hunter gathering communities of Africa, which either denied the presence of chiefs or headmen, declared them irrelevant or even rejected them altogether. The wider implication for South Asia is that we will need to read 
reread history in a new light, especially Adivasi history in a new light and think about their future mobilization in new ways. Some of India's foremost intellectuals have said, you know, unlike India's Dalits, Adivasis have not produced a leader of pan-Indian significance who could inspire and give hope to tribals as elsewhere. Indeed, Ramchandra Guha, a preeminent historian of India says that this lack of leadership is one of the great tragedies that faces tribals today, despite 70 years of India being a free and democratic country. In contrast, what my analysis suggests is that this critique of a lack of leadership amongst Adivasis actually fails to see the virtues of the values that exist amongst them, which is that everyone is a potential leader. Overall, what I'm suggesting is that we need a more revisionist history of subaltern politics than that within a Gramscian frame, which already assumes social movements require organic intellectuals or leaders. And it raises questions of narratives of subaltern history, which have tried to resurrect Adivasi anti-colonial rebellions through the ident identification of one or two people as their leaders. Birsamunda, Sidukano, Nilambar Pitambar, you know, these are the Adivasi leaders that are being resurrected now. For perhaps the real power of these Adivasi rebellions of the past lay in the fact that there was no one leader and that everyone was equally re responsible for leading those attacks. So this analysis makes us question the models of indigenous leadership that are being promoted by many social movements and NGOs alike, whether it's a self critique of the absence of leaders in their movements and organizations from Adivasi communities or actions to encourage the development of leaders amongst Adivasi. For again, what these ideals neglect is that the power of leadership amongst the Adivasis was holding that responsibility in common. Finally, what I've tried to do is show the virtues of sortition in creating a more democratic uh, society. So to summarize briefly, uh, rotation of leadership together with randomness um, uh, of selection ensures that power is not entrenched, hierarchies are not uh, encouraged, status is not accumulated, there is no elite group with specific qualities from whom leaders are selected, Overall, sortition is what gives the selection its authority. The history of its working then can become its authority. Real power remains amongst the people at large, any one of whom can lead and all of whom can be involved in significant decisions, resolutions of conflict. It's an idea of leadership that prioritizes the notion of service and duty to the collective and devalues merit, status, wealth, power acquisition by individuals which create political and economic inequalities between people. All very well and good, you may say, but this is to resurrect systems that are probably no more than a ritual residue of a long gone era, exotic even amongst the Adivasis themselves, and in any case restricted to small scale societies, right? That's the question of scale always brought up. What relevance could democracy by sortition possibly have in our complex world today? Here, uh, I want to make um, three points. The first is that it's worth remembering that it's only for the last few hundred years that we've taken democracy to mean elections. Ancient Athens, medieval Florence, voting in um, leaders through elections was in fact understood to be undemocratic, aristocratic even, oligarchic, since only those with status and money could win for more than 200 years um, from the 6th to the 4th century um, BCE, the Athenians practiced democracy by lot. Random selection of rotating leaders determined who was going to serve in most offices of the, set of the state. Similar practices were said to be found in Florence, also in Venice. Uh, there's no time to detail these systems and there's important caveats to note. Only male citizens were participants slaves and women were left out. The second is that throughout history, um, uh, the second thing I wanna point out is that throughout history, um, sortition, the idea of democracy by sortition has been kept alive from, by political philosophers and activists from Montesquieu to Rousseau, from Marx to CLR James. Most of them have been reacting against the fact that today we see um, that although today we see representative government as, as inseparable from democracy, its modern history is actually uh, 
um, uh, is, is consciously chosen. The third is that um, today most of us know um, sortition only through the selection of our juries for legal trials. But in fact, all over the world, sortition is being revived by those seeking to reclaim democracy from the capture of elites. Um, in today's context in which many people in the world do not believe that elected leaders represent their interests where mon money dominates political campaigns uh, in an environment in which the media is co-opted fo uh, and focuses on sensation, not substance, uh, and where there are partisan divides which are driving policy choices, people are unsurprisingly looking for alternatives. In 2017, the late Kofi Annan uh, highlighted sortition's significance to the, to the Athens Democracy Forum for preventing self-serving and self-perpetuating political classes disconnected from their electorates. Ségolène Réal, the French uh, presidential candidate, envisaged a role for sortition in 2006 in rethinking the French constitution. And in the climate, uh, various climate assemblies in, in France, as well as here, have been using sortition. Um, it's been returning through various practical experiments of reclaiming democracy all over the world. Uh, it's been called the lotocratic uh, alternative, deliberate, deliberative democracy, demarchy, you know, various things it's been called in which randomly selected citizens assemblies are, um, you know, being, are debating for several days about key issues which affect the wider public uh, in order to make recommendations to the public at large or to government itself. You know, we've seen it in the Irish citizens assembly, which actually um, achieved a change in the in the Irish constitution itself in 2016. This kind of notorious changes uh, um, to bring about um, uh, um, uh, uh, legalized gay marriages and change anti-abortion legislation. The UK's uh, climate assembly um, uh, initially called for by extinction rebellion. Uh, in, in, actually use sortition, even though its uh, recommendations are most likely going to be ignored. Now, I don't, you know, it's not the time or place to dwell on the legitimate concerns of all the various virtues and pitfalls of these different proposals for sortition and the technicalities of how they might work out in practice and the problems that they've encountered so far. There is actually a growing literature on this. Well, what I want to uh, end on though, is to point out one significant issue, a final twist. Um, which is that although there are some exceptions, most of today's uh, sortition proposals um, center on the problem, problem of the alienation of voters from parties. They're seeking political equality. They rarely deal with economic inequality. And of course, you know, political equality can impact economic inequality, but if economic inequality is not addressed, political equality at the level of selecting leaders can serve to perpetuate a wider inequality in which leaders selected by lot become a mere token gesture of the idea of equality. So what the Adivasi situation suggests is we need actually a much more wholesale change in the way we choose our leaders and that it is such a radical transformation that could be part of a process that fundamentally challenges economic and political inequality to bring about real democracy uh, to, uh, at all levels. So the point is that if real power for major economic and political des decisions did lie with everyone, then perhaps we might be able to bring back all those debt jubilees that David dreamed of, give proper remuneration for all the work that is undervalued, erase persisting racism, challenge the massive corporations responsible for the destruction of our climate, and all the other systems and structures that are at the heart of inequalities generated by capitalism. This is also why, of course, realizing the full potential of democracy and leadership by sortition is going to be an uphill task for it promises to deepen democracy and threatens to transform capitalism itself, moving towards a trajectory beyond it. It will require significant political mobilization and struggle. Yes, I know some may say that what I have presented today is bonkers, but as David taught us, perhaps these are exactly the kinds of ideas that we need right now. The dead, they say are sometimes more alive than the living. David, as I hope 
you will see through this lecture series, this is certainly the case for you. And that's certainly how I see you. Thank you.